welcome to our uh, week seven lecture um, for the Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership and Transformational Change. Um, I am, feel very honored uh, to welcome Matthew Tuller of Lost Peacock Creamery, who's with us today to talk about um, his work, his journey through Evergreen, um, and um, the amazing work that they do at Lost um, at Lost Peacock. Um, just a few few things to know about Matthew. Matthew attended the Evergreen State College for around two years in total after transferring from the University of Nebraska, where he retired early from the wrestling team. Uh, Matthew came to Evergreen to expand his horizons and studied much about puppeteering and the performing arts. After graduating in, 20, in 2003, Matthew continued working in his family trade as a carpenter. His only experience in farming came from helping out in his small town of Twist, Washington, where he mucked out stalls, changed sprinklers, slaughtered chickens, and branded cattle. He never thought he would run his own outfit, and he certainly never thought he'd make a business out of it. 2018, the housing bubble popped and so did the wage of the working citizen. So Matthew decided to pursue a career in nursing. He still works about four days a month as an ER nurse in Mason County, but that's just his side hustle. His living is honestly made on the farm in Olympia where they milk 70 goats and make the milk into delicious cheese that's then sold up all up and down the I-5 corridor by several different grocery change. chains. They run a Thurston County certified green business all of their electricity is harvested from alternate sources. And Lost Peacock Creamery donates a third of their land to wildlife and conservation, although not formally. They're also animal welfare approved. It's a lot of work, but it's been life's changing experience that Matthew is excited to uh, be joining us today to talk about. Thank you again, uh, Matthew, and I'm gonna hand it off to you. Okay, so. Thank you. And that is that Tamson? Is that right? That's correct. Thank you, Tamson. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. And it means a lot. I love Evergreen State College. I love what it represents. Um, I love the education there. I love what my experience there. So um, it's an honor to do this. Um, that being said, let's get right into it because there's so much to cover and really not a ton of time. So um, just a sec, let me, I'm just gonna get my clock going so I kind of see where I'm at with, with time here. All right, so Conscious Capitalism and Ethical Dairying, Lost Peacock Creamery. So the name of our uh, goat dairy is Lost Peacock Creamery. We've been in business for seven years. Just a little background. Before I started my business with my wife, Rachel, I was about one or two years into my career as a nurse. I had no idea that I'd be starting a dairy. I wasn't even that into cheese. Um, I had milk goats uh, when I was an adolescent boy on a little farm that actually ended up turning into a true blue goat dairy, one of the only ones in the state that's kind of competing with us, but not directly. Uh, and that's in Twist, Washington. Um, so I have had a little bit of experience. I was able to milk the goats by hand. And uh, I owned a Subaru and I mostly got around with a little bicycle because like a good greener, I was very against using uh, fossil fuels if I could at all avoid it, which I still try to avoid using fossil fuels. But the reality of a farm calls for fossil fuels at times, especially my diesel truck, which I use to get hay, deliver hay or receive hay. Uh, like I said, my life before the farm, I was a rock star, at least in my own head. I had, I played bass for a band called Elbow Cooley. I played bass and sang a little bit for one of my other bands that I started after that. Um, that was kind of where I put a lot of my time and energy. And then everything changed when I met my wonderful, beautiful wife, Rachel. Um, sh she graduated from the Air Force Academy. I graduated from Evergreen State College. So like, it's a little, they're different places, but uh, surprisingly, we've been a match made in heaven. I'd like to call us a power couple uh, because 
anyone who can st start up a business and make it work as a team is pretty much that's a powerful thing in my book and if you can do it together and still love each other and have a beautiful relationship together then that is also powerful so kudos to my lovely wife i couldn't do it at all without her uh 2016 is we when we officially started the dairy when we became grade a certified um that's my son that i'm holding there that's my dairy room it doesn't look much different that's a bulk tank that we own we actually don't own that one anymore but it's one that looks a lot like it we own two of them that's my kids holding the rock star tradition right there and that's me and the goats many of which are no longer Actually, those ones are all giving me milk still. So those ones are still in the mix. This in the top right hand corner, if you're looking at the screen, that is my daughter um, and she's helping milk the goats, which is a beautiful part of our dairy is that the kids can help. And just so everyone knows, the goats come in here willingly. We don't force them to come in. They stick their heads in and they're eating while they get milk. So it's just a part of the, uh, the process here so then let's go to the next slide okay the peacock metaphor my wife wanted me to put this in here just as a a little extra thing i'm actually going to get back to this specific metaphor later on because it's not quite what i want to explain yet so my ideals i had a lot of ideals before i got into business before i got into farming i think most people who do become entrepreneurs, have high ideals. And just like anything, your ideals sometimes meet reality and then you have to adjust your outlook and how you're going to proceed. Um, my ideals pre-farming, I will not eat anything but organically raised meat. I will only organically raise meat. Yes, that is, I, I still, mostly right now, I try to avoid any tortured meat. Um, locally raised meat, actually rarely do I eat meat that's not raised on the farm. Oil is bad, yes, but we need it still. Um, if we didn't have it, we would have a lot of people dying, unfortunately, because there wouldn't be a good distribution system for our current way of doing things. And so is capitalism. Well. I used to think capitalism was pretty bad. And I think there's a lot of bad things about capitalism, but I love the fact that I own my own business and that I can make a go at it and make a living at it. So there are parts of capitalism I truly love and enjoy. Never plastic. This is a good one, never plastic. Well, we tried to go non-plastic uh, as much as possible with our business and it's just been a lot harder to do than we expected. And we'll get into that later. Hyper-local only. Yes, I believe in hyper-local. We have been hyper-local the whole time we've been, been in business. And we'll get into the nitty gritty of that as well. Ride bike or go electric. That was kind of my mantra. Ride my bike. And if I could get an electric car, great. All right. So ideals meet reality. What works, what doesn't. First of all, to be a sustainable business, there has to be a business or an enterprise that a person can actually make into a sustainable entity. You know what's hard, though, is starting a business. You know what's harder is starting a farming business. You know what's harder than both of those things, starting a sustainably operated farming business. Let me just go into that a little bit. So we are competing mostly because we're sold in stores. So you see the label. People like, a lot of people like the fact that we're sold locally. They know that means that there's less transportation, there's less CO2 put out there to give them this product, number one. Number two, um, we're able to get all the milk from our goats. We don't import any milk to make the cheese that the person's getting. So, the consumer can rest assured and know that that cheese is produced from quality milk from our farm. The big, comp the big competitors we have are based in California and Wisconsin, the two biggest dairy states in the country. I believe California may have surpassed um, Wisconsin recently 
in milk production, but I'm not, don't quote me on that. Uh, there's a lot of goat dairies in California and they provide a majority of the milk to the Chev producers, Chev being the soft goat cheese that everyone eats down in, uh, from Northern California mostly. And they import it to Oregon, Washington, and really uh, Western, the Western US. And that's our competition. These guys are huge corporations. Most of them have been bought out by international companies who have a lot of money to invest in the cheese business. Um, they, they have a giant uh, amount of employees. They have lawyers on staff. They have HACCP certified inspectors at their disposal. They have massive resources that they use to make, they have food scientists that are making their cheese. Like there's no competition there. They have the expertise, they have the money, they have the know-how, they have the history. We have locality, we have our scruples and we have to stick to our guns when it comes to being local and selling local. It's not easy because they're selling, for every one item we sell, they're selling 10,000. So we have to make a profit and stay sustainable. Our business has to be sustainable on, we, well, we sell one item. So we have to make so much money off that one item and they can sell 10,000. So they only need to make change on the dollar. Whereas we need to make, at least, well, right now we're making about 30 to 40 percent is profit for each item sold. Now, that's that's actually not pure profit. But anyways, they they have they have a much thinner profit margin that they have to that they're dealing with. And that's our competition. And they don't need to be sustainable to get their customer base in there. So what our cutting edge thing is that we're super local and we are we cater to the hyper conscious consumer, the consumer that really cares about where their food comes from. On top of that, we just taste really good. Our cheese is amazing. So when you're ultra fresh like this and you're getting milk from goats that have a great diet, uh you can you can even still be competitive so all right so let's get in here switch the page all right so we do a lot of things that are sustainable um but we've done a lot of things we've tried to do a lot of things that are sustainable that just didn't work so let's go over the sustainability practices that we've uh tried in the past that didn't work all right so Spent grain. We used up, we used grain from a local brewery to feed our pigs and goats. So whenever there's a beer that's brewed or a hard alcohol, um, like a liquor or something like that, the byproduct is usually a high protein, low sugar um, barley, or in the case of hard liquor, it's a lot of the time it's corn. And it's really heavy. Um, when we would pick it up from a brewery, it was in 60 gallon buckets that weighed probably 350 pounds, extremely difficult to get in and out. It was just very hard to move, but we did like the product. Um, the goats didn't like it. If it was certain beer, like if it was a dark beer, there's a lot of burnt pieces of grain in there. The goats wouldn't eat it. They didn't like it. So only certain, and then we'd be stuck with all this grain that we didn't have anything to do with. The pigs might eat it, but even the pigs were picky enough to where it would just sit there. And it wouldn't just sit there and be an innocuous substance that we could spread on the land and like add carbon to our pasture. It would actually attract flies and be a lot of work. So, after about three years of doing the spent grain, we decided to stop. Um, they were going to up their production and we couldn't keep up. It, it also took us about, it would take me about two and a half hours to get the grain and drop it off and pick it up every time. It was so much work and we were already overdone and so busy. So 
we had to say no more to the spent grain and we have had no regrets. Um, really to do it, we would need to get a more, a setup that would allow someone who's not me to get the grain because I don't have the time. Um, and yeah, so a good idea, a way to recycle food back into the system that otherwise wouldn't be used, but just didn't work for us. All right, the second one, Zoe's juice bar. We would feed the pulp to the pigs. Um, very messy business, Zoe's juice bar. Uh, they would put all their extra juicing stuff into a bag, plastic bags, and the plastic bags would often um, fall apart when we tried to put them into the back of the truck. We'd have to haul them in the back of the truck and then haul them to the pigs and throw them in with the pigs. The pigs, we did sell pig pork meat um, before. We don't sell pork anymore, just so everyone knows. That was a part of our business plan, and we'll kind of get to that in a second. But um, We stopped doing it. Also, attracted flies. The pigs wouldn't eat any of the citrus, and there's a lot of citrus in there. So big problems, it would just sit there and we would have to pick it up. There'd also be pieces of plastic oftentimes that we'd have to fish out. It was just a lot of work, it was gross and we were trying to become a profitable goat dairy and it was just not working, which you'll, I'm sure you've had a lot of this kind of stuff happen before if you're, you own your own business or you've worked on a farm. Food waste from stores, same kind of thing. So much packaging. This is a good way to come face to face with the packaging issues of our times. I mean, so much plastic would just be thrown away and incredible amounts of time we would we would need to take food out of plastic and then give it to the animals. And once again, you're not get, you're not able to choose what you want or don't want. They just have food waste that they give you and there's a lot of stuff the pigs will not eat or the goats. And then what is what's another sustainability practice? We would use pigs to recycle any waste products, um, mostly whey. So when you make cheese, the waste product of cheese uh, is whey, curds and whey. So you take the curds and you make the cheese out of the curds. The whey, you can do different things with it. What we would usually do is turn it into meat. So we'd feed it to the pigs. The problem is the pigs didn't eat enough of it. And even that would go to waste. What we do now, maybe a controversial practice if you talk to some dairy people or just the idea of drinking your own milk, but we actually feed our pasteurized whey back to the goats and they love it. They drink it and it's a good way to recycle your protein back into the herd. Um, animal nutrition is so important on any dairy. It's one of the most important parts of having a dairy. If you think about it, this goat, for six months out of the year, seven months, uh, more like nine months out of the year is making milk. And milk is a product that the goat makes to feed its progeny. So it's massively important for that goat to take um, highly nutritious parts of its meal, of its diet and feed it to its babies. And what we do, and we'll get into how and why's of, uh, what we do with the babies and stuff like that. But basically that's, if you can feed some of that nutrition back to the goat, problem free, then by God, that's what we do. And it works. And now we don't have to have pigs. Pigs are a lot of work. If you're not in the business and you're not, if you don't have the time to put into it, they are a lot of work. Um, especially if you wanna butcher them yourself, cause they get so big, you need a tractor. Um, it's just very time consuming. Um, but we didn't, of course, when we sold them to other people, we would have someone come and slaughter and then we'd have them get butchered somewhere else. And um, it just ended up being something that we didn't enjoy and it didn't make us enough money to justify uh, the practice anymore. Um, we used to purchase our grain from a local guy who actually grew all his own wheat out of Winlock. He still sells, it's called Patriot Farm and Feed, and he, he still sells, but it's mostly just chicken feed and chicken mixes that he focuses on. 
And he just, he hit his head. He got into an accident when we were working with him. We had bought grain from him for two or three years. It's funny, the two or three year mark is kind of a theme here. Um, pigs we actually had for six years, but um, that grain out of Winlock was really cool because he grew it himself, uh, pesticide, herbicide free, um, just good agricultural practices used. And, uh, and then he would get different types of grain from around the state that he would mix in with it. We loved it, but he just wanted to, he stopped delivering and he's kind of paring down his business. So we, we uh, were the sacrificial lamb there. So we are working on finding another hyper local source of grain, but as of now, we don't have one. So um, there, are, there is one out of Bellingham. It's so expensive. Um, we can't afford to do that. So growing enough forage to feed a herd of goats. That was another thing we wanted to do. Let's grow all of our own food. I mean, that's the dream. That's the ideal. Any dairy would tell you the same thing. We have 10 acres on a north facing slope in Olympia, Washington. A lot of it's repurposed from a forest. Um, there's forest land. Part of the forest land was logged before we got here. And that's what our pasture is. Um, and it's just not productive, even though we're spreading manure, even though we do the right things. I don't know how much of you know much about soil and farming, but to make a pasture good, almost any time you got to spread um, lime on it, which makes the pH uh, more balanced. So closer to seven um, and soils around here are more acidic, which doesn't lend itself to the growth of healthy pasture most of the time. The other thing we want to do is crop rotation. Once again, if you don't have extremely healthy grassy crops, it doesn't work that well. Goats also aren't really that into grass. I wish they were. Um, they will eat grass if it's really long, but once it gets shorter than six inches, they're really prone to getting parasite loads and they'll get sick. Um, they are not the best animals for crop rotation. You can do it. Uh, and we do it as much as possible, but it just, it, it's a massive majority, like 95% of the food they get is from uh, alfalfa that we import from Eastern Washington. They don't make alfalfa in Western Washington. Um, use glass, not plastic. We haven't found a good way to package our cheese, the soft cheese into glass that's economical. We've tried, it doesn't last. When we put it into plastic right now, we have plastic casing that's shaped like a sausage. Um, and we get all the air out of it. And now our cheese lasts around three months without any problems. And that's just a best buy. That, that, that is a huge thing for anyone who wants to be sold in stores. It's, uh, it's hard to beat that kind of thing. Like you really need to have a shelf life to be sold in stores. And it's been a game changer for us. And yeah, so we don't really use glass much anymore. There's also other hazards that come with it and problems with it. As much as I love glass and hate plastic, plastic is so useful in so many ways. And we're kind of embracing it to a degree, so. All right, those are the sustainability practices that didn't work, so what are some of the things that do work? Um, we, all of the electricity we use is 100% green energy. So, I mean, that's kind of a subjective term, but the idea is that it's not coming from our dams, it's coming from alternative energy sources, solar, wind, um, what's the other one? I think it's like a biofuel, like, um, some dairies do it where they use the, the gases that build up from the manure and run a turbine from that, all kinds of stuff. All right. So then we, we pay 10% extra to 
buy 100% green energy. We feel good about it. We think it's worth it. Um, I, I doubt that our competition buys all their energy, all their energy is clean energy. So we're paying extra in an already difficult situation and still able to compete with these giant companies that don't carry that same burden. Um, we also have our own solar system, a 6.7 kilowatt per hour solar system. It offsets um, our electrical needs probably by about 30% in the summertime. And that's the only time. But still, it's helpful and we like it. And it also the aesthetic, it looks good. It makes us look good as a business to the ultra conscious consumer. We buy alfalfa from the closest possible source. And you might wonder why alfalfa? Alfalfa is very high in protein. There's, it's, it's hard. If you want to get protein for your animal, this is the, the typical source is soy. And if you're not doing soy, you're going to have to go for field peas. Field peas are much more expensive than soy maybe 30%, 40% more expensive. I don't even know what the price on field peas are right now. Um, and you can find some off things, like every once in a while you can find, um, like, uh, what is it? Well, there are some other stuff out there, but the price, the price is just too high. So alfalfa is the best way to get protein into an animal. Guess what? Alfalfa prices went up by they almost doubled within the last two years and Washington. So that was just nationally. Washington saw the biggest price hikes in the country because of how much rain we had last spring. It actually made it. So there was one less um, like one quarter less harvest than there usually is. So usually you can cut the alfalfa and make it into hay three, sometimes four times. Most fields can only do it for two times last year. So way less alfalfa. So there's a supply shortage. On top of it, you have COVID. So for some reason, that caused the export market, which is what drives the prices in alfalfa, to go way up. And who's left to, you know, the people who suffer the worst are the people who have the least economic um, leverage, which is the small farms. Um, and I'm not trying to whine or anything. It's just the reality of the situation. A big dairy, they have giant contracts that they sign. They can pick up all the hay out of one field if they want to. And they sign contracts to make it so that their prices are locked in. And we just don't have that capability because we don't have the, we can't buy that much alfalfa to make that happen. Um, focus on local sales and not shipping. But okay, just go back to the alfalfa. We are actually working on a source of alfalfa. My uncle grows hay and he's actually gonna try to grow alfalfa and he's in Little Rock, um, which is just for anyone who doesn't know, it's just like 15 minutes south of Olympia. It's actually considered part of Olympia, um, but we'll see, we'll see if it works. Alfalfa doesn't usually work very well on this side of the mountains for a lot of different reasons. Um, we focus on selling local and not shipping. All right. So we used to sell in farmer's markets. It didn't work. We just never made farmers like people just didn't want to buy enough cheese from us. We couldn't do enough variety. And also we just didn't like it. It was so much time and we have a family and like, we didn't want to spend all of our weekends at a farmer's market it's cost a lot to pay an employee. We couldn't keep employees into it. They didn't like it either. So the farmer's markets didn't work, but we do sell at local grocers. We sell in all the PCCs in the state, um, um, which is a, the largest co-op, I believe, food co-op in the country, PCCs. Uh, and then we sell in all the Hagen's stores and metropolitan markets, um, the local Olympia food co-ops, several different independent grocers, and then a bunch of restaurants throughout the state. We're currently working on getting HACCP certified, which is a higher level of food safety certification and getting a third-party audit, which just requires more testing, 
um, really to formalize what's already our, like our sanitation practices, our clean food um, preparation practices and everything like that. So formalizing that, making it into a system that someone else could look at and put a, a stamp of approval on saying, okay, these guys are safe enough to sell into bigger stores. So it's very expensive and time consuming, but we believe that that is the next step forward. So yeah, we're going for it. All right, our next sustainable practice. Okay, so anyone who's been on a farm where you have animals, especially a lot of animals, it you're gonna have flies. Flies like poop, goats make poop. So you're gonna get a lot of flies. And I'd say the three or four years when, we're, we've been in business for seven years. The three or four years we were in business, oh my gosh, the flies were enough to make you cry. Like it felt like you were in Dante's seventh level of hell. It was bad, like so many flies. Um, they were so many, like, the, and we couldn't keep them out of the house because the kids were constantly going in and out. It was just, it was hard. It was one of those things where it made you question whether or not you want to stick with the business. So if anyone's listening who has fly problems, we buy fly predators. And over the years, we've used them for two, three years now. It's really easy to apply them. They're actually little wasps. And what they do is they lay eggs in the fly larva and they eat the fly. And it's they're a parasite to the fly. The, the, these little wasps, they're about as big as a sugar ant. And they're incredible. And you just have to spread them like once a month. And the fly population is so much better. It's like, wow. I mean, we walk into the house and there might be like a couple of flies, whereas it used to be 20 flies that I'd have to kill in the kitchen. And it was painful. And now it's pretty much taken care of. I mean, that along with how we deal with the manure and stuff like that. So, okay. What else do we do that's sustainable? We recycle the whey. I already told you about it, so I don't really need to go over it again, but we feed the whey back to the goats. Wastewater for irrigation. So there is wastewater. Um, for instance, we pasteurize our milk in a water jacket, a hundred gallon pasteurizer. When we cool the milk, what we do is we run tap water through the water jacket and then it just runs through. And then we use that water to, to water our fields with, um, if there are any chemicals that go into it, it's minimal and it's pretty strict on what can go into it. Um, because we water our fields with it. I kind of like it. I feel like it's the cleanest thing we could do because it makes it so we are forced to, to really reconcile with what goes down our drain in that room. Um, Cause it's going directly onto our field and we love our fields. Like we ha we take a lot of pride into them in, in it and we want to have lush grassy fields. So yeah, it's it's an interesting dynamic, but like we're we face to face with wastewater management, and um, yeah, so we have very little wastewater on our property, almost none, um, and we we filter all of it. So we and 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 so if there is excess nutrients, the biggest the biggest pol pollutant from our farm is probably excessive nutrients, is what water people call it, but it's too much fecal matter. Now we don't have a ton, like goats make way less fecal matter per animal pound than uh, a cow does. I mean, a goat, goat poop looks like deer poop. It's very dry, there's not much to it. It's mostly grass, but there is some fecal coliform bacteria that will break down and run off. And we don't want to get that into the stream because we're already, we're like right above the ocean. I mean, right above the Puget Sound and people want to harvest oysters down there and they're not able to, probably because, mostly because of bad septic systems. There's a lot of people around there. I'm sure it's bad septic, but we have been, you know, people of, uh, Department of Ecology has come to us and complained and said, what are you doing? What's your management plan? We actually don't have a formal management plan, but we're we're trying to work with the local conservation district, and they're supposed to 
develop a management plan with us. Currently, our management plan is to spread the manure on our pasture. We have nowhere close to saturated our pasture with nitrogen. Um, for anybody who knows anything about growing food, nitrogen is uh, usually you harvest it from like chicken poop if you're an organic farm and you don't have any nitrogen production on your farm. Chicken poop is a big one. Um, you get nitrogen uh, back into your soil from also from like legumes and different types of plants that you grow. Um, they're actually nitrogen fixing plants. You can get it from trees, certain kind of trees. Anyways, our Pastures look way better since we've been doing this. We do have to export, according to um, one of the women who I was working with through uh, the conservation district, there's a certain amount of exporting of material we need to do. We've exported quite a bit of it. I don't know what the actual numbers are. That will have to be figured out later. But yeah, it's something we're doing. Um, What's cool too, though, if there is any excess nutrients that come running off our farm, it's pretty easy to know where it's going because our farm is sloped towards the south and mostly towards the south, uh, southeast, east or west. Anyways, it's all in one corner. And what we've done is we've replanted, rewilded, I guess you could say, that whole southern part, the downhill side. And if you look in this picture right here with the horses on the very bottom end, you'll see like a fence. We keep all the animals out of there and that's, and we planted a bunch of native plants. We actually got a, like a $40,000 grant to do this. And we replanted a bunch of cool native plants, including some stuff that does grow like um, food that a goat later on can eat once it's been established after several years and then we might rotate them through there to get some really cool forage into their system uh and that's that would be a dream that i would really love to have come true but it hasn't yet so um that is our ecological biofilter and if there is excess nutrients usually it'll get picked up because there's like a hundred feet 200 feet of vegetation that just wants to eat that stuff up so it's not going to get into the water stream um i wish we could do testing i don't have i don't know how to do that that'd be cool i'd like to see what it's actually like when it gets down in there we do have we don't have any designated wetlands on our property but we do have like this seasonal pond where ducks come and fish around and yeah i love it down there there's tons of rabbits coyotes we have an eagle nested in our property we have owls um, I said, I think I said coyotes, coyotes are not a problem. They still, they kill our chickens sometimes, but like, we, we just see that as like an offering to kind of being on their land. Um, yeah. So that's one of my favorite parts of our sustainability practice. Weeds. Oh my gosh. Weeds are like so hard to deal with. If you're a farmer that manages like all of our pasture there's weeds that I have to contend with. I've managed to do so. I mean, if there's goats on that portion, luckily the goats will eat the weeds. Um, surprisingly, my horses will eat the thistle. They'll eat the heads off the thistle if they're bored. Um, but there, it's hard. I can't get them to all those places and it's the last thing they'll eat. So I still have to do a lot of mechanical removal of weeds um blackberries i do use the goats on blackberries i have a per, i have a temporary fence that i'll run behind there um, with a solar powered battery and that's pretty cool because they just kind of stay behind that fence and they'll you leave them in there and they'll eat the they will eat the blackberry bushes um because blackberries can easily take over your farm and take over your pasture so that is how we deal with that. Um, and then I wanted to get into a few other things like how are we sustainable? Those are sustainable business practices, but there's more to being a, a business than that. And there's more for, to, there's also just parts of being in business with animals that you kind of have to take into consideration and sometimes conflict with sustainability. Um, 
are we are why am i passionate about dairying um i don't like factory farms in general i i think that I, I really believe in honoring the animal as much as humanly possible. I don't, this is a really cool story I wanted to share with people. I didn't put it in here, but the myth, the mythos, the legend of goats and humanity and how humans met goats is a pretty cool one. So goats is one of the, mo one of the first domesticated animals uh, that humans ever had. And the myth goes 10,000 years ago, it's probably longer than that, like Mesopotamia, think Mesopotamia times, think Samaria, think Persia. Um, the, the goats, the, the head of the goat tribe and the head of humanity kind of came together and came up with an agreement. And the agreement was, okay, if you take care of us, take care of our health, feed us, make sure we got good food, protect us and shelter us if we need it. We will give you clothing because they have fiber and they have leather. You, we will give you warmth. Back in the day, humans used to sleep with animals because they didn't, that was the way they would stay warm at night. Um, and they would give you food, milk, cheese. All right, so, and th that, and in return, we would keep them safe from predators. So it's kind of a, a romantic idea. Um, Raising animals, if you really love animals, is probably, especially as a farmer, is one of the hardest things you can do because death is an inevitable part of the process. Um, and so we're just running into this right now. Like we have to take, and a lot of people, no one likes this, but we have to take the babies from the moms um, to produce milk because if the babies are taking the milk, we have no milk to sell. So it's kind of cold and calculated. It's something that I've had to wrestle with as a greener who just like overthinks everything and really wants to make sure they're doing right by the world um, and be morally responsible, socially responsible, ecologically responsible. Oh my gosh. Um, it's been hard to wrestle with this one, but this is what I know because if we keep the, we tried to do this actually, where we kept the babies on their moms. We tried different ways of keeping the babies with their moms and none of it's worked. It's actually been more painful for everybody involved. Um, we have to sell the babies. We can't keep all the boys because we have no place to grow them out. And then if we were to grow them out, we would have to sell them as meat or sell them as pets. But if they stay on the mom, baby goats can't be good pets. They need to be bottle fed to become good pets. Rarely will babies that are kept on the mom or kids kept on the mom actually be turned into good pets because goats have natural suspicion of predators, hairless monkeys with eyes that are close together. They know we're monsters that will eat them if we are hungry or desperate. They are not stupid. So because of that, you need to brainwash them at an early age. <laughs> That's a mean way of saying it, but you need to connect with them at an early age by feeding them and caring for them and showing that you're not all bad. Um, when you do that, they, you develop trust with the animal. You can sell them as pets and they, they uh, have a lot of potential to live on someone's home. Mostly, most of the time they live on, at someone's house Almost all of our goats are sold as pets. I don't know many of them that aren't. I always encourage people to, if they have a female, to have them grow out and be milkers. T take their milk, use their use the cheese, use because otherwise, sustainability-wise, it's not sustainable to own companion animals. It's just not because they're all like you need to have them working for your food system to make them. So sustainability wise, it's a, it would actually be more sustainable to raise out those animals and sell them as meat. Um, animal welfare wise, animal welfare, that's okay. Um, appealing to the public, not really okay. The public wants us mostly to sell them as pets and make sure that those baby goats have a really cool place to go that's not uh, the freezer. 
So that is a tough one for me. But uh, the other part, but, but it, it works. And like these goats usually have really good lives because what we do is we take them and we give them to a kid and his, he's like a homeschooled guy south of here. And he takes those goats and he sells them to people from all over the state who just want to have a goat for whatever reason they want to go. Most people just want them as pets. Um, we keep about 10 to 20 goats a year. It's very expensive to raise them. But yeah, we keep about 10 to 20 of them and they go back into our herd. Um, and then it, when it comes to retiring goats, we have, okay, so this is a cool statistic. Dairy cows usually give milk for two and a half years. They're done. Their life is two and a half years. And then they go bye-bye. Like you, you make them into dog food. I don't think they're, they may be made into burger. I actually don't know. There's a lot of different ways you can process the animal. Um, guess how long a goat gives us milk, like productive member of society, like 10 years. Now we don't milk them for 10 years because during the eighth, ninth, seventh year, a lot of the time their milk quality goes down and we need high levels of quality in our milk to make the cheese that we do. So what our original plan was is to just keep them on the farm and just like let them live out their life and get old and die of in their sleep um of course reality or or the other alternative would be to send the goat like to sell the goat when it had a few more years left uh to someone who just wanted a goat for a little while and always wanted a goat and we would give them away to someone and they would retire on someone's farm uh this is what happened when we retired goats on other people's farm within two years we would get a call the goat's sick okay What's going on with it? They tell us usually it was pneumonia or the symptoms of a UTI or just high parasite load. They would treat the goat for those problems and it would happen again because the goat's trying to die. It's getting old. It wants to die. <laughs> That's what things do when they get old, turns out. Um, we, there's, there's a level of stress that comes to leaving your herd. These goats have family. They're with the same giant herd for 10 years. It's, it's really hard to send them somewhere else. It's hard on their mint, mint like they're just, it's, it's anxiety ridden situation for them. That's one reason we don't do it anymore. We also don't believe that letting an animal die and suffer, uh, suffer is also good practice for caring for that animal. Um, after years of figuring it out, what we've decided to do is we eat older goats, which is a very rare practice in this country right now. It's not rare in third or in developing countries. It's the norm in developing countries. Um, but here people poo poo it. Like you're not supposed to eat, to eat an older animal. We don't sell the meat at this point. Um, we can talk about that a later, later too. But what we do is we process the animal. Um, we use a 22. If anyone doesn't want to hear this, just mute me. That's fine. But a 22 bullet kills it instantly. If you know what you're doing, it's like they're hanging out, eating their last meal. Boom. They literally like their body goes catatonic. They fall to the ground. Um, and the way, and their meat tastes amazing. It's extremely good. And so I could get into the butchery and stuff like that but that's the point though is that's how we honor the animal like we take its life before it gets all the tumors and before it gets sick and like you know just old age like your your body starts to break down as you're still alive like you're it's just a slow death really so that we found to be the most um it's it's, it's kind of a, a marriage between sustainability and animal welfare so that is how we deal with the goats live. That's how we retire the goat. And that's how we deal with the baby goats. Um, we, they, the goats all have names. They all have personalities. Uh, there's, um, it's, yeah. So we are animal welfare approved. And yeah, that's, that's the main thing. That's why we're, that's the, I say that's the main reason I'm passionate about dairying is to, 
give an animal a good life, as good a life as possible, and still make a product that's really good. So yeah, that's that doesn't always marry with sustainability well, but we try to do our best. Um, okay, yeah, what's the hardest part of my business? The necessary evil of separating moms from babies. Um, yeah, the moms are pretty sad for the first, well, like looking for their babies and anxious, probably for about 24 hours. Um, some of them a little bit longer. Some of them actually reject their babies right away. This is another thing to think about. In the wild, um, deer's infant mortality rates about 50%. Um, when we take goats from moms, the infant mortality rate is closer to like 3%. We almost, almost all of them survive. When we leave the babies on moms unattended, we probably have closer to a 50% infant mortality rate, even though there's not, it, the babies don't always latch onto the udder. Um, the moms lose their babies. There's a, a myriad of reasons. There's a much higher survival rate when we take babies from moms. So, um, okay. And then I talked about that. So the inevitability of death, how we deal with death. Okay, let's go to the next page. I think we're close to done. In a perfect world. Okay, so if we had like a magic wand, we'd probably be certified organic. That'd be really good for our sales. The reason we don't certify organic is because I will treat, I'm a nurse too, I'm an ER nurse. I, I will treat an animal with antibiotics. Just so everyone knows, if an animal is treated with antibiotics, that milk is never sold. Um, you, you can't sell milk that's been treated with antibiotics. For one, if it's made into cheese, the cheese won't work. Every time milk is processed for cheese, the first thing they do is check it for antibiotics. Why is that the case? When you make cheese, you put a culture, aka a bacteria into the cheese to ferment it, to eat the sugar and turn that lactose into lactate, lactic acid. Um, that bacteria will not live if you have an antibiotic in the milk because that antibiotic will destroy that bacteria. It doesn't work, just so everyone knows. There's a withhold time. Whenever you give an antibiotic, there's a little withhold time printed on the case saying, you can't use this milk for 48 hours, for 72 hours, sometimes for a week. So you have to honor that or it'll nip you in the butt. We package our products. It'd be cool if we could patch it, package in glass and just have a full on CSA. CSAs, we do a cheese CSA. If anyone wants to buy from our cheese CSA, I think you can check out our website, um, follow us on Facebook, sign up for a cheese CSA. That's my plug. Um, we have about 200 member, 200 people signing up for a cheese CSA. It's cool. We can use glass. Let me tell you something though. It's hard to manage 200 people coming onto your property and picking up cheese. To do glass, to, to, to store the glass, to clean the glass, to deal with the liability that comes with glass. If there's a chip of glass, someone bites it. There's a lot of problems with glass. There's a, there's a lot of extra management that comes with glass, unfortunately. There are some dairies who do it. Tuna Worth does it really well. I applaud them. It hasn't worked for us. Um, but we do a cheese CSA and we do use like, okay, we do it with the restaurants. We reuse a lot of stuff. So we bring buckets, five gallon buckets of Chev, which is the soft goat cheese. They will give us back a five gallon bucket. We do that a lot. Um, in a perfect world, the babies would stay on the mothers and still be acclimated to humans. Doesn't work like that, unfortunately, but in a perfect world, that would work. That'd be the case. We grow all of our own forage for the goats and do not import any onto the farm. Not only would that be financially great, it would be great for fossil fuel um, use and we would make way less CO2 and it would just be a, a we would sell more cheese because the super hyper conscious consumer would uh, appreciate that. We would retire every girl 
on the farm. Well, we pretty much do that. We just retire them a little bit early. Um, use no plastic, only use sheets with natural. Um, the other thing we could do is sell hard cheeses only, in which case we don't really need plastic to sell hard cheeses. The problem with selling hard cheeses is we can't compete price-wise. So for every gallon of milk, you get about a pound of hard cheese. For every gallon of milk, we get 1.8 pounds of soft cheese. Um, there's also a lot of work that goes into hard cheeses that I can't really get into right now because we're almost out of time. But yeah, so let's go to the next slide. Yeah, we already talked about that. All right. Okay, we already talked about that. Okay, so just real quick. Okay, of course, we have my kids helping midwife. You know, it's pretty special to have a family on a farm. It's special. We used to have um, more agritourism events. I'm almost done, Bonsai more agritourism events. It's a powerful thing to have kids on the farm and just see what it's like to, to be close to your food. Um, it's powerful. I love it. I love being able to work at a place and have my kids be a part of where, where I work. It means a lot to me. And that's a huge, probably the biggest reason why I wouldn't want to give it up, even though we work way more than 40 hours a week, most of the time. Um, it's not work though. It's a lifestyle. That's, that's what I tell myself. Um, that's pretty much it. Is there, I'm wondering, do I answer questions or do people have any questions or should I just, what, what do you want to do? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, um, let's take a moment, everyone to just thank you. Thank Matthew for, um, for walking us through their amazing work on lost, uh, little else peacock creamery and your passion for your work. And what you're doing um, is very, very tangible. So very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, open the floor for questions. I've got a few questions. I know that you're probably running short on time, so we'll keep it brief. Um, I'm fine. Before, yeah, I can. I, I, I have a little time, but no problem. Awesome. So before I ask my question, anyone have specific questions for Matthew? Yeah, so the way we do our CSA right now is very hands off. So like we have a refrigerator downstairs and people just come and pick up the cheese from the refrigerator. So like we have it all in there. They come and they get their stuff from the list and they grab it and they go and we can just keep farming while the CSA is happening. So for us to do that, we would have to stop what we're doing, come back, or we would have to be on the farm, which we're not always on the farm. We usually are, but then we'd have to come back and do it. And like people are coming all different times of the day. So I guess what we could do is have them scoop it themselves. Like we could have the option, like if you want to take scoops from this container and then they'd have to scoop it and then like have a way to clean it, which we don't have a sink in there. So yeah, that's a possibility. Um, I mean, if that was something, if we could always reach out and ask people, um, we would have to set something up, but that's a possibility, yeah. Yeah, well, and with the spent grain, I mean, it is an amazing product. It's really high in protein. Certain kinds of spent grain, the goats just love it. And, or pigs, like if you're raising pigs and even chickens, it can be a really cool thing. It's just the logistics of getting it on and off the property, the time commitment is massive and you just have to be ready for that. And realize that you're not getting a free product um, you're paying with your labor and that's how a lot of stuff on the farm are a farm is. And so it's just really important that you're aware of that. Um, and also the flies thing, like, uh, the fly thing is rough. So. 
Well, I've got a question for you, Matthew. I first just want to um, extend my appreciation for you know your entire session, but particularly you you started your session with <clears throat> um, what you thought you know your your values sort of pre being an entrepreneur, being a farmer, first generation farmer, and a lot of that continues. But particularly, um, you know, your thoughts around sort of being a part of of capitalism, and you know, one of the points of this lecture series is to to demonstrate to our community, to our students, to our faculty, and to our staff that um, you know, being a transformative part of our system when it comes to things like the market and capitalism, it, that that can work. Um, as as a business owner. So I just want to first extend my appreciation to that. Um, my question is um, a little bit, it's not super specific. I just, you know, wonder if you could give our students and folks in the room a piece of advice of like starting your own business. It's a scary thing. It's a big risk. Um, and, um, you know, you have to sort of take take this take this leap of faith, but also pair it with really hard work. So any, you know, words of advice um, that you have for students that maybe want to pursue this as a, um, as a career, um, but have to come overcome some of those, those barriers and those challenges. Yeah, I, I personally love having my own business. Um, growing up, my dad had his own business as a general contractor. Um, Farming businesses for the creative mind, I think, can be a pretty cool playground. Uh, as long as you're willing to put in the work, because everything requires quite a bit of sweat equity. Uh, and it does help if you have some skills or you're you're willing to go on YouTube, which I think most greeners are kind of more apt to like go on YouTube and learn new things. Um, what it... <sighs> I think what it took for me is um, a combination of things to get into it. Number one, I was desperately in love with my wife and wanted to please her and make her happy. <laughs> um, I was new to the relationship and I always wanted a farm. Um, I just didn't know. I didn't know if I wanted a farm business, but I wanted a homestead versus a farm. Um, and I was like, well, she's going for it. I'm going to go for it with her. Uh it took a lot of naivety, being naive about what it would really take. Cause looking back, I don't know if I would do it again. It's been so much work. Um, I don't know if I told you, but when I first got to this farm, it was, there were no fences except one giant perimeter fence. And then the goats were just running around in there. It felt like a developing country, which I loved. Like I traveled in Thailand. I lived in Thailand for about a year and that's kind of how they do it there. So the animals were just everywhere. So like I'd open the door to get into my truck or I had a Subaru at the time and the goats would just like jump in and eat the chips that fell on the ground. So like that was my life beforehand. It was really cute for like three months. And then I realized like, I can't really, like this isn't gonna work for me. Um, man, it's, I love the fact that when I, that's, so that's, that's kind of, the starting point, I was very naive. Um, but I, I also have a real like can do attitude. I don't really like dealing with bosses. I, I like it when you miss make a mistake in a business, it usually costs you a lot of money or costs you a lot of time. And it's almost always a giant headache. For some reason, that's a better tool for me to learn. I, I like it better than having to like confess my sins to the almighty employer looking over me and like have my tail in between my legs. I would rather like, you know, fix an electrical issue or have to treat a goat in a way that like, you know, takes a lot of extra time and energy and effort and money because of a mistake I made feeding that goat the wrong thing. So it's a, it is a different mindset. I think to get into your own business, you have to be okay with risk. Speaking of risk, we're taking our biggest risk of our whole career 
um, this year because we're buying about $100,000 worth of equipment and upgrading our business with stuff that we think will make us sustainable. And we're, for the first time, taking loans out. We haven't taken any loans out to run our business. This is the first year we're doing that. So it's scary. I'll be honest. I had like an existential crisis out there working one day, just like, what are we doing? Uh, farming is ultra capital intensive. So if anyone gets into farming, it's so much money that you have to spend. It's, it's insane. Um, but you can make a lot of money too. It's, um, I still work as a nurse one day a week, but that's our only ex income that we get from out of the farm. And, uh, yeah, it's, it is scary. You have to accept it and come on. I mean, what happens in the U S when you are financially destitute? Most of the time, if you're still mentally capable, you can still have enough food, you can still have enough water, you can still have shelter. So I think it's good to temper your fear with that. Um, I also like, how do you deal with anxiety? Because you're going to have plenty of it. And you just have to realize like, I need to have my coping mechanisms. For me, I meditate. I used to meditate a lot more before I owned a farm. I do cold dunks in the morning. Um, that actually has been huge for me personally. My wife is one of those people that just like, she just needs to work and do her thing and she's completely fine. Um, I'm a little bit more high maintenance and I accept that. You won't have the time to give yourself that you're used to when you have your own business in the beginning and you should be willing to accept that. And also how am I gonna deal with the with the difficulties that come with that because i'm also a dad so i can't be in a grumpy mood when i'm raising my my kid because it's not okay it's not right it doesn't feel right so you have to make sure that you're the type of person that can do it and, and just realize most of owning a business is fixing problems one problem then the next problem the next problem and at first it's going to be overwhelming but then you're going to learn how to manage that and compartmentalize this is my work day this is my time with my kids you know, I could go on forever about it, but yeah, that's the short and sweet of it. Awesome. Thank you. I've got what, one last question if you have time, if there's no yeah. other questions from our, yeah. uh, our audience. Um, yes. I'm going to pause to make sure. Okay. So my, the final question that I have is um, if you could just speak briefly about um you building relationships with other local businesses mm. and like supporting the local economy as part of the local economy. You know, you mentioned, um, oh, we got a question in the chat. What did you use for the flies? So oh yeah, the fly predators. Let me look it up here. I'll, I'll post it here in a second. Okay. So. All right. Cool. Yeah, so you can go ahead with your question. Um, yeah, so just, you know, talking about some of the close relationships that you have, um, to some of the local businesses, you mentioned, you know, your Thurston County green certified business. Um, I'm, you know, are you part of like the chamber of commerce, um, any other local business networks, um, that. Yeah. yeah. So we, um, well, as far as lo local, like Olympia goes, we love Olympia. We love, we give, we sell our cheese for less to like, um, the food co-ops and they only mark up 30%. So the best prices you can get on our cheese is at the food co-ops. Um, and then also we, you can get a great price on our cheese at, um, what are the, what's the other independent grocer? Uh, there's another independent grocer on Capital Way next to Dick's. Does anyone know that one? Um, Spuds, Spuds Produce Market. Yeah, Spuds, they sell our cheese. And I love it because they don't mark our cheese up. They go, they sell more of our cheese. And so does the co-op. So we don't feel like we're ga price gouging. Because if you look at our cheese at Hagen's, it's selling for like $9 for four ounces. And if you go just right across the way to uh, Spuds or the co-op, it's sold for like less than five bucks. So... And we haven't gone up, by the way. During COVID, we did not increase our prices. We didn't increase our prices when alfalfa went up. We're trying to increase, we're trying to just increase volume so that we can that increasing your volume in a dairy or most any production kind of stuff, you can that's a shock absorber for instead of upping your prices, you can 
just kind of maintain because you're making profit off of each individual sale. So um, I forget, what was the question? I just went on a tangent there. You're all good. Just about your relationships with, with local businesses. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we've, we've, we tried, well, there's a lot of people who reach out to us to do like um, donations to auctions. So uh, boys and girls club, we we give cheese to them for auctions. Um, there's a couple other places. Uh, Thurston Talk, we've done a lot of stuff with Thurston Talk. Um, we've worked a little bit with business incubators that do egg business incubation. I forget the name of the one in town. Uh, but yeah, yes, we love our local stuff. The main thing like Spuds and the co-op, I love that they don't mark up our cheese. Like they just, they actually mark it up less because they want to, it's like, it's like, I, I don't know what it's called in the grocery business. It's like a bait item. So it's an item that they're making very little profit off of. Um, but it's their bread and butter that gets people into the store and then the person will buy other stuff. So yeah, it's great. It's, I love it. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Matthew, and thank you for staying on with us for a little bit. I, I appreciate you taking the time. So I'll, um, again, um, if if we could just give thanks and claps and cheers um, to um, to the wonderful time you spent with us. Very, very proud that um, that we call you a greener as well. So, um, yeah, and I was going to, I just posted my email here. So if there's anyone who wanted to reach out, um, I think we are going to hire someone, a cheesemaker slash farm person um for the next season so i posted my email if you're interested in that also if you're interested in goat husbandry or starting your own farm business we have done educational stuff in the past but i'm also cool with like someone writing to me and then you know i can give you my phone number and chat it up let you know what i think um i don't know if i'll have time to like let you come on the farm and look around we've done that in the past it usually we charge people just because man we're busy yeah. but um sometimes you know I, I feel um gracious and i'll just say come on out so anyways i really appreciate you guys listening it means a lot i love greeners and i love that i could share with y'all so thank you awesome well thank you and good luck they're they're in their their busiest season right now i'm assuming with yeah. the kidding season so good luck with the, with the hard work that goes into that as well thanks all right. All right, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Um, and uh, in uh, week, what are we? Week seven. So we take week nine. We'll be joined by Michael Twiggs, um, a, a graduate out of the um, Tacoma campus to talk to us about um, hydroponics and uh, his business. And then week 10, we'll be joined by Oren Hardy, who lives out of Bali and who um, runs a educational program, architecture, design sort of um, place in Bali um, that uh, builds builds things out of bamboo. It's really, really cool. So um, keep an eye out for those invitations as they come through your inbox. And thanks again for uh, joining us today, everyone.